So this is part number three of this series that we are calling Pillar Talk, as in pillars of a strong and healthy marriage. And there are some of you also that are here, you're single. And listen, if you're sing single, you want to lean in during this series because you're going to learn what a successful marriage is. And you want to work on you. You want to become that right somebody. You don't want to just be looking for the right somebody. So you can use this as a barometer. If you're dating, is this guy, is this girl, is, how are they treating you? Do they line up? That kind of thing. So lean in, okay? And we're basing this series off of a great book called The Four Laws of Love by Jimmy Evans. So a lot uh, of what you're going to hear during this, this series comes from Jimmy Evans and Pastor Jimmy Evans in this book. And Jimmy says it this way. He says, marriage is the safest relationship on earth when God's marriage laws are honored. And so what I'm talking to you about are the pillars, these laws of love, these pillars of a strong marriage. So in the first two weeks, we looked at Genesis uh, 2, and we know that God made man and woman, and he called them husband and wife. He married them. And as soon as he married them, he said these things over them. He says, that's why a man leaves his father and mother. In other words, pillar one, he will prioritize her. So we discovered that pillar number one is that your marriage must be the priority in your life outside of your relationship with God. You prioritize your marriage over the feeling of in love, over your children, over work, over play, over your, par your parents, everything. Marriage is not going to work unless it is priority one outside of your relationship with Christ. All right? So then it said... He is united to his wife. So last week, we discovered that that word united in the original Hebrew, it actually meant to pursue. So in looking at how Jesus pursues us, all right, because the Bible uses that comparison a lot between husband and wife and Jesus and the church, us, we find out that Jesus pursues us by serving us. So last week, we talked about the foundational pillar of, pr of pursuing by serving. And we discovered that if two spouses are pursuing God, that uh, by default, they will actually begin to get closer to each other. Amen. All right? And pursue, each, and, and then they, they can be closer with each other. And so that, this is the triangle that Melissa bought me. So if you pursue God, you will begin to have his heart for your spouse. And then you'll begin to naturally pursue them as well. And so that was pillar two. You can go back and listen to all those messages on our website or YouTube. Today we're going to talk about pillar three. All right? Pillar one is uh, he's going to leave father and mother. Pillar two is going to be united. And number three today is they become one flesh. So pillar three today is simply partnership. Okay? That you are going to be a strong team. Now, any married couple, when they first get married, we all have a dream of growing old together, right? You know, that just be, being best friends until the end. And the truth is, is that many, many marriages have never actually seen that play out and, and outcome. And in my research, I found this video about Dave and Allison, or Alice, who were 90 years old. They married when they were teenagers, and they had the same dream that we had, but they accomplished their dream. Check this out real quick. But these days, you gotta hang on. It's Dale, who's the engine behind Alice's wheelchair. Better get your legs off. The Rockies are each 99 years old. They met just after the turn of the last century as kids in the small town of Hemingford, Nebraska. I didn't pay much attention to him, <laughs> really. Did you pay attention to her? Not especially. <laughs> but. By the time high school rolled around, Dale looking suave and Alice the picture of loveliness, things had changed a bit. Do you remember what your first date was? What you guys did? Went out on the hill and parked and looked at the town. You went and parked on your first date? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to Christ our Lord, amen. Alice was a good Catholic girl, so no kissing and telling here. Suffice it to say that as soon as Dale turned 18, he popped the question. How did you propose? I asked her if she had any money. <laughs> they were married December 29th, 1933. 
Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers were appearing in their very first movie together. FDR was in his first term as president, and Prohibition was just winding down. Had Prohibition been repealed in time for you guys to go buy a bottle of champagne somewhere? We couldn't afford that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a bottle of pop. <laughs> yeah. By 1958, Dale and Alice were already toasting 25 years together. They were still laughing after 40 years in 1973. Pretty good looking couple. They've now made it 81 years. Is there a, a secret to how you guys have stayed together for so long? What's that? I always let him have my way. <laughs> you always let him have your way. Very good. <laughs> this year's longest married couple. It's such an achievement, the faith-based group Worldwide Marriage Encounter crowned the Rockies the longest married couple of 2015. Great. Yay. Rockies were picked from nearly 400 married couples, most nominated by friends and family. 1939, 75 years. Dick and Diane Baumbach yes. thought their marriage of 48 years was long until they founded the longest marriage project five years ago. When we saw 83 years, 79 years, it was a wow. Mm -hmm. They don't claim the honor is official, but they hope couples like Dale and Alice serve as a reminder of what a lifelong commitment can look like. Is there a common thread that runs through marriages that last seven and eight decades? Yes. Yes. What's that? They do things together, enjoying things together, by compromising and having patience with each other, I think. Well, 11. Dale and Alice have five sons, including Tom, now 76. Two for two. He and his wife, Sandy, married 50 years, by the way, visit Dale and Alice at this skilled care facility outside of Kansas City. This has been a busy day. Alice's health demanded she come here, but Dale didn't have to. He got himself admitted because being together turned out to be the best medicine of all. Once Dale came, you know, and got moved in, Alice's, not only her spirits, but her health just improved. I mean, they need to be together. And maybe in the end, that need for another person is the real secret of wedded bliss. What a wonderful ride we've had. After 81 years, Dale and Alice don't want for much, except more time, hand in hand. It does sound like a long time, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> well, it has been a good long time. Isn't that cool? <clears throat> now, that is what we all want, isn't it? But you know, for all the differences between men and women, husbands and wives, 70% of both men and women say that the determining factor in whether or not they're satisfied with the sex, the romance, the passion, everything within their marriage is specifically the quality of their friendship, that they're partners together. So sometimes you hear people say, yeah, well, my, my spouse is my best friend. And sometimes we ask, well, is my spouse really my best friend? Well, one of the foundations of a powerful and a strong marriage is friendship with your spouse or to be strong partners. And a lot of times this topic gets pushed to the side because we tend to focus on, you know, the things that are causing us pain in our marriage or issues that we need to work out, conflicts that we have. So a lot of times what we do is we neglect this area of friendship that actually has the ability to strengthen and, and, and grow your relationships or your relationship, hopefully, <laughs> to, where, to where it's much better. And this idea of being a strong partner, being a friend, is paramount. Now, I believe that we can be intentional in how we actually grow together. And I think a lot of couples are unintentionally doing some things that are actually, they're hurting the friendship. But while at the same time, they, a lot of times we don't know what to do to strengthen the friendship. We don't know how to be strong partners throughout life like Dave and Alice. And I believe that successful and healthy couples we see our spouse as their best friend, their partner in life. But a lot of times, especially as we're married for a number of years, we tend to grow apart as opposed to growing together. And so maybe you're married or maybe you're looking to get married, 
Well, the first important thing is to be in a relationship with somebody who that you feel that friendship connection with, all right? But it's so easy sometimes to allow, uh, to allow communication to break down or, or different things to happen, and then you begin to drift apart. So maybe you sometimes feel like you're missing some of the passion, or you're having a lot of arguments. And look, all, all our, our relationships have disagreements, but when you're constantly arguing and bickering or criticizing or even giving the silent treatment, you know, friendship can begin to break down, and it can kind of begin to seem like an illusion after a while. And a lot of us can feel the pain of that, some of us even while I'm talking now. And that can happen in marriage where we begin to grow apart. So the question is, why, A, why do questions grow apart? How, how is it that somebody that you love so much and you want to live your life forever as best friends, as partners in life, how is it that we grow apart? Well, research shows that 93% of adults believe that having a strong, stable marriage is important. Okay, that, that was a very important thing to them. But less than half actually believe that it's possible. See, people haven't lost the dream of marriage. They've lost hope in marriage. The good news is that marriage works. God created it. See, the problem is not with marriage. God created marriage. The problem is that sometimes we don't understand how it works. And God's perfect plan for marriage, look, it's found in the Bible, where partnership is in the Bible. Now, the problem that we have, though, is the scriptures that talk about this, that could actually help us with this, we actually don't like it very much. Because, because at the surface level, level the, the language we use today, it's actually offensive, to be honest. All right? See, God never created anything to fail. He never creates anything to hurt us or to frustrate us. And, but listen to this, okay? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, Submit to one another. Out of the reverence of Christ. So husbands and wives, we're supposed to submit to each other. Now most of us are okay with that because that sounds like a friendship, a partnership. That's what we want. That's the third pillar. But then Paul goes on and messes it all up. In these next verses, they are some of the most, I'm, I'm speaking in jest. These next verses are some of the most hated verses in the Bible. Watch this. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, for he who loves his wife loves himself. There's more. Hang on. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, the text that we just read, it is one of the most disliked texts in the Bible for Christians today. We like about what it says about our spouse, though. If a guy doesn't know any other verse in the Bible, he knows that one. <clears throat> and then also, women... Look, they love what Ephesians 5, when you, when you read Ephesians 5 to a woman, it says your husband is to lay his life down for you and nourish you and cherish you. Man, that's her dream. And I'm just saying, we love what it says about our spouse. We just don't like what it says about us. The, the woman says, well, I'd submit to him like the Lord if he, liked it, if he acted anything remotely like God. And if I submitted to him and respect him, it would just enable him. I, it, he's got a huge ego. All the, I'm, my job is to keep him humble. <laughs> and then the men say, you know, well, I understand what it says about laying my life down. But look, that's not going to work for her. She'll take advantage of it. I'm going to have to share my feelings all the time. I mean, like, this just doesn't work. Now, I want to release the tension in the room just a minute in regards to this verse and let you know that this verse, these verses are extremely powerful in your marriage, but they have been taken out of context and they don't mean what has been preached for a long time. Okay, look, and nobody should be threatened. Nobody is going to be a victim of Ephesians 5. Okay, it's going to be the best thing that ever happened to either one of you. 
okay? Now, when the Bible says submit, you got to understand we are equals, okay? Men and we, women are complete equals. Uh, Ephesians, it started out in Ephesians 5.21, it says submit to one another. So we're submitting to one another, all right? So we're equals. So when the Bible uses the word submit, it's not using it in that sick kind of sense where men dominate women, okay? Melissa and I, we never talk about who's the boss of our house. Jesus is the boss of our house. We are complete partners. We submit to each other. We don't make decisions, major decisions, without agreeing. Okay? She doesn't dominate me. I don't dominate her. That is sick. It's dysfunctional. And that's not what the Bible is talking about here. Okay? Paul starts out saying, no, we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then what it does is it's going to go into... How wives submit to husbands and husbands submit to wives. It's going to explain how we're going to do that. All right? And what's amazing, if you can get over the trigger word of submit on both sides, <clears throat> what is absolutely amazing is that what this is teaching us, it's teaching us how to partner together by submitting to each other. Because, see, men and women have different needs when it comes to us partnering with each other or submitting to each other. All right, so what I want to do today is I want to break down this passage and really just show you how these instructions can actually help you become stronger friends, partners for life. And it is, po it is possible to grow together, to love each other till death do us part. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to talk with the guys for just a second. Studies say that the number one need of a woman is security. Now, the Bible understood this. God understood, God made them and understands them. And so it says that we are supposed to be Christ-like husbands to lay our lives down for her. All right? Now, what makes her feel secure is the selfless, sacrificial man. So when Melissa and I first got married, I didn't understand this. And to be honest, I produced total insecurity in my wife. When the Bible talks about me and how I'm supposed to behave around my wife to nourish her, to cherish her, to lay my life down. You see, verse 25 says, husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church. Well, how did Christ love the church? We talked about it last week. He gave himself up. He served us. So remember last week we looked at Luke that says he, Jesus, will dress himself to serve. We'll have him recline at the table and he will come and wait on us. So husbands, how are we supposed to love our wives? We're supposed to wait on them. And all the women said amen. amen. And remember, Ephesians 5 started out saying we submit to each other. So it's trying to explain how we submit to each other. And the way that husbands are supposed to submit to their wives is the same way Jesus submitted himself to us as a servant. Now for generations, men have lorded it over women. I'm the head of the household. Well, great. I'm glad you understand that because what that means is that you are the greater servant. Now, when Jesus was developing a relationship with the church and describing that relationship to the church, security was very important for Jesus to make sure that we knew we don't just hope we're going to get into heaven. We know we get to heaven. There's security in that. The bride of Christ needs security. Brides need security. We, in our relationship with God, we understand we have a right standing. The biblical word is righteous, but we have a right standing in our relationship with him. It's secure because of what he did on the cross. We call it being born again. And when you're born again, you simply ask him into your life. You give your life over to him, and then you have that relationship, and there's security in it. It was very important for him that we felt secure. That's why we don't have to earn salvation. We're secure. And so continuing with Paul's imagery and just really comparing Christ's relationship with the church and husband's relationship with his wife in the same way that it's important that we are secure in Jesus, women feel more secure when they have a selfless, sacrificial husband who is tuned in to them and has a servant's heart toward them. Women feel insecure when they have a selfish, detached husband who's not in tune with them. See, what makes men attractive to women is this sacrificial nature where we lay our lives down. They've actually done studies of women, and they asked women, what makes your husband the most sexually attractive to you? 
and this is across numerous studies they've done this, and either at the top of the list or always toward the top of the list is this response. <laughs> when he's doing housework over and over and over, and women, they love it. He, he's the sexiest when he's got a broom. A lot of men think, you know what, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to get my six-pack, I'm going to get my tan, that'll turn her on. Nope, just grab the vacuum, that's all she needs. <laughs> Wash the dishes, help out around the house, absolutely true. And then they did this study, and this has been duplicated over and over as well. The University of Pennsylvania did a study of the effects of male sweat on women. And these researchers took male sweat and they put it on the top lip of women. Now, they didn't tell them because they wanted to live, but... <laughs> They, they told him it was some kind of product, and they put it, male sweat on the top of their lip, and watch what happened. They put it on the top lip, and then they wired them up so they could, they could register the effects of their sweat on their body. And women who were under the influence of male sweat, they were more relaxed, they got happy, and they got romantic, if you know what I mean. Isn't that absolutely crazy? Isn't that amazing? God says to man, sacrifice, lay your life down for her, work for her, serve her. And you're like, man, I don't want to do that. I want a wife who's, you know, ready to go, at, always in the mood, and I don't have to do any of that. They don't exist. Sorry. At least in the real world. God has made women to where they are attracted to men when they are being sacrificial and serving. She becomes attracted to that. And here's the interpretation for all of us guys. You're just, a clean house, not, you're just a clean house away from the night of your dreams. Okay? <laughs> Ladies, studies say the number one need of a man is honor. The top three basic needs of a man is honor, sex, and friendship with their wife. And if you want friendship, you get there by the other two. All right? We're going to talk about honor. Honor is oxygen to us. Our egos are so fragile, it's hard for you women to even understand, okay? Humiliation, lack of respect, it affects us more than you could ever know. And 1 Peter 3 is actually talking to women, and it's giving women this promise that you can change your husband, his disobedient behavior, without even opening your mouth. Watch this. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Now, remember, when it says submit, you got to remember that what Paul says is that we're submitting to each other. We're, just, we're not saying that you're not an equal. We're saying this is just your side of the deal, okay? You're, you're part of submission. It's not using it in a, may, in a way that men have abused in the past, okay? So then he goes on to say, and he says, So that if any of them, the husbands, do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. It's talking about honor. Because God understands, God made man, and he understands honor is the number one need of a husband. And so it says, when they see the purity and the reverence, the honor, of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hair store styles and wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes, but rather should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That is simply an honoring spirit. That's not mousy or weak, okay? It's just honoring. That gentle and quiet, that honoring spirit is a great worth in God's sight, all right? So when the Bible says gentle and quiet, it's opposite of just boisterous and loud. A, a gentle and quiet spirit is a spirit of trust. It's I don't have to disrespect you to get my way. I don't have to browbeat you. I don't have to nag you. I got God on my side. I'm going to have a gentle and quiet spirit in confidence. And listen, ladies, you are beautiful. You're beautiful. You can't help it. But don't ever let your beauty just be on the outside. You need to be inwardly beautiful as well. Okay? Now, our society, the, the, see, the more inwardly depraved a culture comes, the more external beauty is important. Okay? So the less that you have happening on the inside, the more you have to make happen on the outside. And look, I'm all for women being beautiful on the outside, okay? But don't rely on your outer beauty because what makes you most attractive to a man is your spirit, Amen. okay? Now, Melissa and I met when I was 12 or 13 years old. We went to high school together. 
And there were a lot of cute girls in high school. There were a lot of, uh, there were cute girls, but I didn't like their spirit. They were ugly on the inside. Any, anybody know, don't point or anything, but anybody know those people? All right. There were pretty on the outside. But the thing that attracted me to Melissa is that she's not only beautiful on the outside, but she was precious on the inside. I was attracted to her spirit. That's why I fell in love with her. Okay? And what Ephesians 5 is saying is this. Respect your husband. Respect is so powerful to him in a man's world that you could actually change the direction of his behavior without a word. By your behavior when they see the purity and the reverence of what's on the inside okay and i'm not telling you that i'm saying the bible says that okay god and look god's not putting you down he's giving you the key to your husband's heart and look if you have sons i'm telling you ladies you'll never influence your boys unless you show them respect they have the exact same need to be affirmed in order for them to open up their hearts and and for you to influence them and men and women, married couples, when we understand the power of what Paul is saying here in Ephesians 5, then you can become partners for life. You can have a partnership, friends. And look, you, you can't be intimate with somebody until they open their hearts. And you'll never open your heart to a person who is actually threatening your most sensitive issues and needs. Whether it's honor or whether it's security. Look, I'm not going to do it. If you're dishonoring me, I'm going to listen to you, but I am not opening up my heart to you so that you can hurt me. A woman, she is not going to open up the door for you to reject her and walk away and not be tuned in and not be there for her emotionally when she needs it. If we're going to have, if we're going to be partners in marriage, it means that we are going to have to trust each other. And trust is at the foundation of every strong relationship. Every strong friendship, every strong partnership. Trust is the key to your lifelong friendship, your lifelong partnership. All right? So here's the big idea. This is what I want you, if you don't hear anything else today, hear this. A man trusts an honoring woman. A woman trusts a sacrificial man. Okay? A man trusts an honoring woman and a woman trusts a sacrificial man. Bible tells women, respect your husband and men, lay down your lives. Look, he's not putting us down on either side. He's telling us how to have the key to our spouse's heart and establish trust and intimacy in a relationship. You see, Ephesians 5, if we'll follow submitting to each other in the way that we need, that will continually build trust in a relationship, which brings friendship and partnership. And look, Ephesians 5, actually, it makes us attractive to the opposite person to to our spouse see we marry sometimes when we marry based upon an only a physical attraction that will that will evaporate evaporate eventually a strong marriage is made by honor and security the brilliance of ephesians 5 is it makes us sensitive to our spouse's needs it naturally makes us sensitive men and women are telling us each other what we need what we need but we're not actually listening to each other and if you go back to last week, a lot of times it's because you don't have a heart to pursue your spouse by serving them. We're just thinking about what we need and how the other person can serve us. But when, but when one spouse comes to the other spouse and repents and says, look, I haven't, been Christ, I haven't been Christ-like or I haven't honored you. I haven't laid down my life for you. I have not cherished you. I have not nourished you. I have not respected you in the way that you needed. And I put other things ahead of you. And I apologize, and I will change. And to my own, to my own sacrifice, I'm going to meet your needs. And you won't have to nag me. You won't have to say it twice. You won't have to demand it. I prioritize you. And look, that's that's our dream. And look, when when we say that to each other, what's going to happen is that we're intuitively going to begin to listen and meet each other's needs. And look. When, when a woman comes, comes to her husband and says the same thing, when a man comes to his wife and just say, hey, look, I didn't understand my words and the subtext of what I was saying. I didn't understand how that hurt you and how important it is to you. 
and I'm sorry, and I'm not going to justify it anymore. No matter what society tells me, I will never justify not serving you in the way that you need to be served. And I know that God put you in my life for a reason, and I am committed to be a godly husband, a godly wife. When you do that, you naturally begin to pick up on what the other person is trying to say and those things that are important to them. So imagine a marriage where two people are friends, partners in life, and the reason is because there's trust in that marriage. And the reason that there's trust in that marriage is because you are mutually submitted to each other in a way that each other actually understands and actually feels. And if we can add this pillar of partnership along with priority and pursuit, then we can. We can live to a ripe old age as best friends. Would you stand with me?